as titans of steel, shaking the earth, veritable walking fortresses, the super heavyweights. So, last time we went over just my rough general principles of design with an example, but I thought it would be of great interest to actually look at them in practice alongside the remaining aspects I did not mention, and to do so I thought, why not focus on one of my all-time favorite styles of mecha, the super heavyweights. It is somewhat ironic that given how big mecha grow to, and how obviously mechanical and metal they are, they actually rarely seem to fall into this category and actually seem to rarely be that heavy. The super heavyweights are a special group of mechanical designs to me. This small group takes the weight and mass of these massive walking buildings and actually sticks to it. There is a concerted effort within these designs to say, this thing is damn heavy. This thing has a lot of weight to it, so even if it falls over, you could end up dead just from the impact. Now, as easy as it would be to say, mech started slow and got fast, it's really not that cut and dry. Mecha did broadly get more fast and a little more zippy, but I think it's good to look back at what came before and what needed to happen for these designs to be possible. If you look at a very archetypal early design like Tetsujin 28, you can already tell it's strong when it needs to be, but it's also shown to be flying by jetpack as well. So, it can also be fast when it needs to be fast. This is one of the limitations that kind of stopped the super heavyweights from emerging sooner. In order to really commit to being slow, you need more than just a design focus. You need to kind of accept that what you're making isn't just some atomic-powered, super-duper machine, and is actually somewhat limited by the world. And this is kind of what makes these designs kind of special. They are slow, and if they do speed up, it's a significant event. It's not something they regularly do, perhaps. But this also obviously shows the other reason this group is so rare. The combination of animation and money. Yeah, your animation needs to have a set caliber of detail available. This is because, in order to communicate the mass of these machines, it has to come from more than just the machine itself. It has to come from its environment as well. As perhaps one of my favorite and a fantastic example, it's the first appearance of one of my all-time greats, the Big O. It's really a beautiful example. There's so much gorgeous detail put into this introduction. The Big O tears apart the pavement, and I mean, just walking around, it feels like miniature earthquakes are going off. Within this sequence, though, is one shot that I think really, really encapsulates this. It's barely a few seconds long but look at how fucking cool it is. We see the interior of a random building, completely unimportant to the plot and never shown again in the entire show. But during its fight, the water inside, the pool that's inside this room, splashes back and forth. You can feel how every punch from the Big O, just even the most basic attack, a closed fist, is sending shockwaves through the very atoms of this world. It takes time and effort to consider these details, and to spend your finite and expensive budget on them. The Big O, after all, was only originally 13 episodes, compared to some shows at the time running for a more typical 26 to even a 50 episode average. And oh boy, when the fucking Big Impact's piston charges out and it fires, oof. It's fucking perfect. You really feel as if the ground is shaking, and you really feel as if a massive amount of something has just hit into something else. It really leaves you with an impression of weight. For an alternate example, Pacific Rim by Guillermo del Toro shows us a western take on the same principal approach. For Guillermo, it seems obvious the importance was there for making the Jaeger mechas intensely weighty and with a definite sense of mass. You can just see it in the way Gypsy Danger almost has to mechanically rev its strength up to lift its arms before dropping them down into a blow, or how, once again, simply punching seems to be representing the actual mass of tons of steel in its arm, of a fist the size and weight of a steel diesel train plowing into a monster's head. Even when the Jaegers are damaged, we see this. When Gypsy Danger is thrown, it careens across a shipping yard, because, yeah, something that big, something the weight of multiple tanker ships or a whole city block, it's heavy, and it's not going to come to a stop all at once. Another shot that wonderfully expresses this is when Strike Eureka goes into a full sprint. 
you can almost feel not only the huge swinging mass of the arms and legs running, but also of it plowing through the water in massive strides. At points, it almost seems like it's in slow motion, but the reality is it's just the intense heaviness of each and all of these machines. Guillermo cited The Colossus, a painting by Francisco de Goya, and I think he really nailed that impending sense of something inherently on a titanic massive scale in just its every action. It's also perhaps one of the biggest things the unsurprisingly disappointing sequel completely missed the mark on. Where now, even though the movie has tons of cash, or perhaps because the movie has tons of cash but a weak creative vision, the Jaegers now lose any sense of momentum and careen around the environment like an NVIDIA graphics tech demo, smashing into buildings almost carelessly. It really loses the imposing importance the original approach had in the first film. So now, returning to anime, I want to introduce the final three principles of mechanical design. The first three groups all play into animation, but they can also be purely applied to how the robot is designed and just how it's looked at. The last three, however, are really their own category, and they're unique to animation itself. They are dexterity, or how reactive a mecha is, energy, or how they react with their environment and against it, and finally, the one that today's video is focusing on, mass, or how they impact directly into the environment with their presence. Now, I know those sound all a little similar, but I'll be focusing through this video series to specify the differences. I think as a follow-up example of perhaps a very fascinating and specific one is Evangelion. Evangelion was made as arguably perhaps the last work of the first golden generation of Gainax. The animation team had the money, or well, they kind of had it in the first few episodes before they spent it all, but that's a story for another time. And that's why the Ava units are kind of all over the map in terms of how they are portrayed. Now, for the film, they had a concise budget. So today I'm going to focus squarely on the final climactic fight of End of Evangelion, between Unit 2 and the mass production Avas. Two big changes have happened here. First, its proportions become more humanoid, less extreme, and less lanky as in the TV show, and closer to a tokusatsu actor, a guy in a suit basically. Something like Ultraman, which Anno was consciously pulling from is a very real human proportion. Additionally, something else happened. They got heavy. They got weighty, like really, really weighty, to the point even though later and earlier versions of these mecha would become more speed-oriented and more zippy, you kind of lose this, this film's approach squarely hits the mark of the super heavyweights dead on. Asuka and Ava Unit 2's fight shows this very specifically. It starts off with Unit 02 lifting an entire ship and then throwing it in a massive show of force. All of Unit 02's movements are swift, but they're extremely powerful and they're very considered in how heavy they should be. Kind of like how a wrestler telegraphs his moves. It shows off the movement of what they're about to do, but it's really there to also generate a big impression. This then gets turned up 300% when the mass production Evangelions arrive. Like, I, I just want to focus on some highlights here, as the whole thing is, I think, one of the most gorgeously animated mecha sequences in the genre. So Asuka takes Unit 02 into this jump, and, and really, just look at the weight and force of Unit 2's complete effort into just splattering this guy's head. As in, all this force just goes right into the skull and just shatters it completely. Then after that, the unit lands on all fours, and look at how the ground elastically ruptures from the force of impact. The ground pressure of the landing breaking open the structures of the soil and the buildings on it. As another example from this fight, there's this fantastic shot. Notice how the MP Ava's blade slash spear thing that they are fighting with leave these contrails in the air. It's as if the volume of the airflow over the blade is being considered as a detail. Because yeah, a sword, this wedge thing the size of a plane wing slicing through the air at that much weight, it would develop pressure and airflow vortexes around it, which would probably condense moisture into some kind of contrail. We see this again when the MP Ava is thrown through the air, sucking debris and smoke and dust with it. We also see the Ava units absolutely carve through the earth. Something as big as these things would, of course, not simply step on the ground evenly. And for sure here, whole hills and cliffs are gouged through just by the casual steppings and strides of this fight. So once again, it's a fight that looks very swift, but the point here is that the mass is being considered, the weight. Ava Unit 2 is being thought and taken into account, and it's being shown on how it impacts the environment. I will admit, it's perhaps not as pure an example outside of this movie, and the Avas can get very, very zippy later on, uh, when they became this, so these things kind of get lost. 
But within the context of this film, and within the context of this one sequence, it's very, very much present. It's very much drawing from the inspirations of tokusatsu shows like Ultraman and the others. Shows that had to work with cinematography to try and show miniatures as, well, not miniatures, and as suit actors as these immense things. Using camera effects like slowing down the frame rate to try to communicate an immense size and power and slowing down explosions, for example. What makes this as kind of an interesting thing is that the Big O also took from Tokusatsu as an inspiration for these kind of dramatic, heavy, one-on-one -on -one fights, albeit just from slightly different shows than from Evangelion. Now, as another interesting note, the Big O's staff also worked on something else. To close off, I think you know what I'm gonna show you. You know what I've kind of been hinting at, there's no way not to end on this guy probably undisputedly the king of the super heavyweights. In mechanical design and in animation, a mecha who one could very well describe as a walking iron mountain. Giant Robo. Giant Robo is so goddamn thick. This is due in part to one of my personal favorite mechanical designers, Makoto Kobayashi, in his effort to redesign it from the classic giant robo into the one used for this OVA. Once again, his introduction says it all. Windows shatter, neon lights flicker from the impacts, and the ground rocks and blowback from its giant footsteps. One kick or punch is titanic enough to obliterate enemy machines. We see this similar trend of simple, direct blows causing catastrophic damage. Even its smallest caliber weapons, the cannons on its torso, are practically like battleship guns. It really is a fantastic, imposing design even when it fires up its rocket pack, it seems insanely, like, heavy. It's not a zippy jetpack, it feels like twin Saturn V rockets taking off. And oh man, this pose. I, I do this pose when I wake up in the morning. It's a really good pose. <laughs> but yeah, in terms of the actual mechanical weight, actual steel and reactor-driven machines carrying that human form, nothing feels quite so hefty as Giant Robo. So I hope you enjoyed this little focus. I will look forward to doing more and focusing on some designs soon, as well as focusing on the artists behind them, the mechanical designers. But next time, it's time for a happy little video about a cheery girl and her happy dog who get into some wacky hijinks, and it leaves a big impression on a young boy, and hilarity ensues.